Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Compliance Online Live Webinar, Stability Studies and Estimating Shelf Life. Our speaker for today is Stephen Wax, has 25 years of wide-ranging industry experience in both technical and management positions. He has worked as a statistician at Ford Motor Company, where he has extensive experience in development of statistical models, reliability analysis, design experimentation, and statistical process control. Steve, please go ahead. So by way of introduction, um, I'd like to just define a few things. And uh, you know, a lot of people just sort of interchange stability study and shelf life study. I, I, I prefer to kind of um, keep them a little separate because um, I, I would call it any kind of study where we want to sort of understand and, and model degradation over time uh, or sort of lack of stability, it would be a stability study. Whether or not we're trying to predict an ultimate shelf life or not, um, that's a stability study. Um, often we use these kinds of studies to perhaps extrapolate our model to the point where we would actually determine, be able to estimate a shelf life. Uh, shelf life, let's just define as this this length of time that we're going to use to help set an expiration date on our products, um, but it's basically the length of time that we can actually store uh, our product, um, you know, without it becoming unfit for use or consumption. Yeah, so it's basically how long how long will the efficacy of this product um, still survive and this could be time on the shelf before it's in the customer's hands or plus plus the time that the customer has the product but hasn't quite used it yet um, a few other uh, just basic uh, framing the problem here um, we're going to be focusing on rather simple studies where essentially we're we're going to be doing our testing under some defined set of conditions, storage conditions, with some product, with some packaging that's um, used on that product, perhaps. And the goal is to estimate the shelf life with some level of uh, certainty or precision. Um, certainly, we could envision or perform more uh, sophisticated experiments where perhaps shelf life is not just going to be a byproduct of our formulation and our packaging and our storage condition, but rather we're going to perhaps design our product, the formulation, what additives we put in. Uh, we're going to design our packaging um, so that we achieve a target shelf life. Maybe that's some kind of competitive uh, or important uh, characteristic of the product. And so in those kinds of experiments, we are going to have a lot more factors other than just time. We're going to be looking at um, how to perhaps, the, how does the formulation of our product affect shelf life? How does, how, do, how does the packaging material or the thickness of our material or the type of material, whether it's, you know, let's say an ultraviolet light or not, or, or you know, you can imagine any kind of uh, uh, differences, but, or understanding how storage conditions affect shelf life so that we can maybe prescribe the uh, the uh, shelf life as a function of a, of a specified storage condition or range of conditions. So when we really want to understand shelf life as a function of not just time, but also of uh, these other factors, then we, we could envision a larger experiment. And I would strongly encourage uh, anybody that's planning to do that kind of a study, uh, use a methodology that's really designed to, to efficiently learn uh, what the effects of these various factors and their interactions are on the key responses. And shelf life may be one of the responses, but there may be other performance requirements that you're incorporating into this DOE. Um, so uh, DOE is a design experience is a very uh, useful um, method when applied correctly and uh, statistically sound experiments will allow you to, to learn and develop models are quite useful with without um, you know necessarily collecting huge amounts of, of runs. OK, 
Okay, let's define fitness for use and turn this into how we sort of are going to assess shelf life. So um, we're going to be focusing on objective, uh, quantifiable measurables of uh, characteristics. Um, so we'll have quantitative uh, numbers that we measure uh, that we can assess against uh, actual specification limits. Um, there's no reason uh, you, you're limited to that, right? You're, some of the failure modes might be more subjective, appearance-based, um, or tactile, or visual um, things, uh, or taste. And um, those are probably going to have more natural variation from, from you know, uh, assessment to assessment, even for the same product. Um, and those, those handling that kind of data is going to present some challenges, but we're not going to really be focusing on that in this particular webinar. So what we do with the quantitative data is we have to define shelf life um, based on, uh, you, you know, we, we can't say we're going to set a shelf life so that we're 100% guaranteed that nothing will be out of spec. Um, I mean, you can probably get pretty close to that. But the reality is because we're using statistical models, which use distributions that kind of naturally go off to infinity, at least on one end, if not both ends, uh, we, we don't get to numbers like 100% until we get to times like infinity. So um, instead, what we're going to do is define a shelf life based on some acceptable uh, risk of some proportion of the product could actually be at a spec. Now, whether that's 5% or 1% or a tenth of a percent, that's going to be up to you based on uh, the risk and the cost and the, those kind of things. All right, so all that is uh, uh, now like the finish of the, the sort of the background, conceptual definitions, you know, how do we define shelf life? Um, we're now going to go ahead and move into uh, talking about some of the methods for estimating shelf life. And I'm going to spend just uh, a few minutes up front on this life data analysis idea. And I'm going to go through it um, probably a little bit quickly because of, of time constraints. And it's more of I wanted to make you aware of this other approach. I want to make sure we reserve the, the bulk of the time for dealing with you know, traditional stability studies and make sure we have time to go through those examples because um, that's honestly what most people are, are looking for when they um, want to do these kinds of studies. Um, and anyway, I just want to make sure we don't, don't run out of time to do that. In the case where where you're really more interested in when are things going to fail or no longer be acceptable, and you have more than one characteristic or component in your formulation that's changing over time, and you really want to account for the probability that any one of those on a given product could fail first, then I think the appropriate way is to sort of use a, a life data analysis approach and use distributions like Weibull or Normal or some of these common time to failure distributions to um, derive the, um, uh, to come up with these uh, probabilities that we're, we're ultimately going to be getting. So I'm just going to kind of uh, kind of walk through how this works. Um, basically, we're going to test units until they fail. Now, not every sample has to fail, um, but at least some do. And we're also not going to throw away uh, cases where we have units that survived uh, or failed for one reason. We're going to keep track of how long they survived for the other failure modes and incorporate that into our models. Okay. Um, so this is called censoring, um, where um, we could have right censoring, meaning that um, <clears throat> a, a unit survived a certain period of time and never failed. So maybe we had one sample that didn't fail for any reason. We're going to basically give credit for surviving to say 1,000 hours for all the components. Or maybe um, we had a unit that failed because component A degraded too much, but B did not. So we, and we, A failed at 1,000. For, so for B, we say that the time to failure is bigger than 1,000. It didn't fail yet. Um, there's also sometimes censoring that goes on where the failure occurred some between some interval uh, of time that you know, as for inspecting periodically and not continuously, there might be some significant interval where we don't know when the failure exactly occurred, so we can put in an interval sensor. And less censoring just means that the failure occurred prior to some known time. All right, again, we're going to be using quantitative uh, measurements here and using regression modeling to, um, 
to, to sort of model the, the, the trend or the degradation and determine when do we actually need a, a spec limit. Um, before we get into a bunch of examples here, I just want to uh, make a quick comment about using regression models. Uh, because basic regression has some assumptions that may or may not hold for your shelf life studies. Uh, so basic regression models, what they do is they, they basically take scatter plot in the simple case of one predictor and one response. It's essentially taking a scatter plot and fitting like a best fit line through the middle of the data. So we're modeling the mean uh, or the 50th percentile of our data. And the reason the mean and the 50th percentile are the same is because uh, the assumption is that uh, in a regression, in a standard, you know, least squares regression problem, the assumption is that at, at any given value of the predictor, so in, in, a, in a stability model, it's going to be time, the variability that we see in the value that we're measuring is going to be normally distributed. So you, you sort of, the regression line is kind of going through the mean of a bunch of normal distributions here. Um, this is a different example. We're trying to predict a score in a test versus how many hours of TV or, or kids. All right. In the last uh, couple minutes, I just want to say, say a few words about some issues and guidelines and some recommendations. Um, I know we started five minutes late, which is, you know, made me r rush a little bit, but I think we were we were waiting for everyone to get on. So. Um, I'll, I'll stay a little bit past, you know, 2.30 if there are questions that, that you want to, me to answer. Um, so here's a few issues and, and just general guidelines I want to mention before we stop. Um, you know, if we're basing these shelf life estimates on extrapolations, like the examples I showed you when we got to the stability studies, there's some risk in that. And that, you know, we're fitting a, a model, whether it's linear or nonlinear, to the data. Uh, let's just suppose we, it looks linear. Well, we're assuming that that model will continue all the way out until we hit the spec limit. You know, will it or won't it? I mean, um, it would be helpful to have, um, you know, maybe a food science or a chemist or someone who's involved in the degradation that knows the degradation mechanism that can validate that that should continue in that pattern. I mean, statistician generally may not know that. Um, but scientists would, perhaps. Um, but it's always nice to take those uh, projections or estimates and validate them with some longer-term testing. So maybe you're going to launch your product with this shelf life based on these assumptions, but you know, with some longer-term testing, we might get some different information that may even allow us to justify a longer shelf life. Who knows? Certainly, the more we extrapolate, the more uncertainty. Um, when you're fitting these different models, um, you know, especially like with life data analysis, you could try Weibull or normal. Um, it's a good idea to use sensitivity analysis, meaning what happens if I use other models or on the stability says, what if I use a linear model versus a quadratic model? I'm not sure which one is best. How does that impact the results? And um, maybe we should be most conservative when we come up with a shelf life so that we can you know, be very comfortable that, that we're being uh, legitimate here, okay? Um, when we select our specimens uh, for testing, you know, it, it's going to be better to test from different lots, different batches. Um, you know, there's going to be variation in production. There's going to be variation in uh, the equipment and environmental conditions. And if the goal is to come up with a shelf life, um, that reflects the potential worst conditions, then, you know, it would sort of be a little bit um, risky to just base it off everything at nominal, like on a perfect day or whatever. So uh, think about how you're going to collect the data that you're going to be putting on shelf life test. And certainly to some extent, testing from different batches over time will, will allow that some of that variation to creep into the data if, it, if there is going to be differences. Uh, sample sizes are... are um, an important issue because you know the, the more the less data we have, the more uncertainty, and therefore the lower shelf life we're going to be able to put on our product. Um, maybe it's not going to be matter for what your shelf life you're targeting. Um, there are some analytical methods to calculate shelf life, but they do require that you um, have some idea of variation, and then you could also like do some simulation to try to figure out um, uh, how, how much data you would need to overcome. 
um, variation in the the uh, data that you're seeing, either starting values or variation in how how much the product degrades over time. 